After watching this video, you should be able to describe triglyceride biosynthesis as well as metabolism, list the major locations involved, describe the basic structure of a triacylglyceride, be able to describe the synthesis of a triglyceride in the liver, ultimately ending up to a triglyceride in an adipose cell, and be able to say a little bit about the regulation of production and metabolism of triglycerides um, and a little bit about the fasting and well-fed state. So if we start with the location, in addition to the liver being an important site of triglyceride synthesis, adipose cells also play an important role because after all, fat cells is where we store triglycerides um, and we tap into that during a fast. And as far as the structure goes, we can see there's a glycerol backbone, a sugar backbone, and then we have three acyl groups or three fatty acids coming off of the sugar backbone. And we can see that in the first position, it's labeled R1. If it's the second position, it has an R2. And in the third position, we have an R3. Usually the first um, position is occupied by a saturated fatty acid, the second position by an unsaturated fatty acid, and then the third one could either be either one. As far as regulation goes, it's kind of interesting because the production of triglycerides really depends on fatty acid flux in the, um, the cell. Um, if it's the liver cell, for example, the fatty acid flux could be from making lots of fatty acids through biosynthesis, but also potentially during a fast if we have um, lots of fatty acids um, entering the liver as well. And as far as metabolism goes, um, there's a very important enzyme called lipoprotein lipase, or LPL, that we'll discuss and how it's affected by hormonal regulation during fasting and well-fed state. So let's take a look at the big picture. And we can see that um, we have, at least in this um, organization, we have triglyceride synthesis coupled with fatty acid biosynthesis. Now, we would expect that because when we make fatty acids, all right, and we're running glycolysis, we have all the ingredients, we have the sugar backbone and the any fatty acyl groups to make triglycerides. And so that, that's pretty logical. Theoretically, we could have triglyceride synthesis over on the other side too if we had lots of fatty acids entering the liver through, through um, fatty acid release and weren't really doing a lot of ketogenesis. But just to keep it simple, we put trigly triglyceride synthesis over here with the fatty acid biosynthesis and all of these other um, elements as well. And the way these are regulated will come into play later. Now, if we go and look at um, how this might appear in the liver, um, like I said, um, if we were considering triglycerides just being on the well-fed side, we see here that when we're um, having glucose entering the liver cell through GLUT2, um, while we just had a meal, we're having lots of um, G6 phosphate, we're running pentose phosphate shunt to make NADPH to make fatty acids and cholesterol. We have 2-pyruvate, which ultimately will go to acetyl-CoA, which you need to make fatty acids and cholesterol. And ultimately, um, when we have all these ingredients, we're making triglycerides, we package it with cholesterol and some other proteins, and we ship it out as VLDL. And we'll see that this VLDL is going to go to, to, to various tissues, including fat, where it'll dump off the, the fatty acids, and it'll resynthesize triglycerides. Okay, so that's how it might be on this right side during the well-fed state. Um, during the fasting state over here with this consideration, we're not showing any um, triglyceride synthesis, although that could potentially occur if there was a lot of fatty acid flux coming into the, into the liver cell. Now let's take a look at um, a little more detail with the well-fed state in the liver, okay? So this is the consideration. We have lots of glucose because we just ate a meal. Um, it's entering the hepatocyte through facilitated fusion uh, through the GLUT2 transporter. We have our glucose 6-phosphate form through glucokinase. And remember, as we go down the glycolytic pathway, um, one of the trioses that we form through the aldolase um, cleavage of the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is dihydroxyacetone phosphate which normally goes towards the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to enter the rest of the glycolytic pathway. In this case, the DHAP can become glycerol phosphate through a glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase reaction. It's an oxidative reduction reaction. We're, we're using an NADH to make NAD+. Okay, and we have now this activated sugar molecule, which we've shown here as 
um, drawn out with the carbons and everything, we see here we have two OHs, uh, and in the occupying the third position, we have that phosphate. So this is a glycerol 3 phosphate molecule. All right. Now what we need to do is we need to transfer acyl groups to this molecule to form our triacylglyceride. And we can see here that in the, if we add it in the, in the one position, um, these are attached to CoA molecules which fall off, and we would form a, um, a monoglyceride. Uh, Okay, then if we add another one, another acyl transferase, we now form this molecule phosphatidic acid, which now has two acyl groups, or you can call it diacyl glycerol phosphate if you like. Now, um, this phosphatidic acid needs to have that phosphate removed, right? This phosphate here that was added um, uh, during this process, um, going from DHAP and glycerol phosphate, it already has that phosphate that it had from early on in glycolysis. And if we remove that phosphate through some uh, hydrolysis, we now have this diacyl glycerol molecule, which is just a glycerol backbone with those two fatty acyl groups that we added early on over here with those acyl transferases. And then the final acyl transferase, a diacyl glycerol acyl transferase, adds that final third position. And now we have the triacyl glyceride, uh, or, or um, TAG. Okay, and if we add a little bit of cholesterol and we add some apoproteins, okay, we now can form a molecule that's going to transport this around in the plasma called VLDL, or very low density lipoprotein. And I just highlighted here some important apoproteins that it could have, uh, ApoB100, ApoE, and ApoC2. And this is a complicated process of how it acquires these apoproteins. Some of them are acquired through interactions with uh, high-density lipoprotein, or HDL. And I'm not showing that here. I just want to show you the um, uh, simplified VLDL molecule emerging out of the liver. You can see that it mostly has triglyceride, indicated by TAG, and it has some cholesterol esters as well. Okay? So um, we can see that we needed to have the sugar coming into the liver to have that backbone and then we needed the fatty acids to be added. And you can see now why we need um, fatty acids either through biosynthesis during the well-fed state or just increased influx in other situations that would drive triglyceride synthesis. Okay. Now in the liver there's some other ways that you can get glycerol phosphate. There's also a glycerol kinase enzyme that's not shown here. but um, I'm using this as an example because this is the same process that would also occur in adipose uh, building up a triglyceride molecule. Now what happens when the VLDL is in the plasma? So that's what we want to look at next. And it would look something like this. So now um, we just are zooming in on an on a, on a, um, adipose cell. okay? And this is a capillary. Okay, so the VLDL is going by this tissue. This is not just going to be occurring in adipose. Um, the LPL enzyme is anchored to capillary endothelium all over the body. It's just that the fat is a very important place um, to consider. So in this example, we're just focusing on blood flow to the fat cell. And we can see here's our VLDL molecule, okay, that has the B ApoB100, the ApoE, and the ApoC2. And it's going by, and the LPL, the lipoprotein lipase, is going to be acting upon this molecule because the ApoC2 is a cofactor for this enzyme and makes make sure that it's activated. Okay? Another mechanism that, that ensures this LPL is going to be around is if you have the well-fed state and you have lots of insulin around, insulin induces this enzyme. So with the combination of insulin around and ApoC2 present, um, the LPL is going to hydrolyze the triglycerides, deplete this molecule of triglycerides, and make a remnant of VLDL called an IDL, or intermediate, lipopro uh, low, uh, intermediate lipoprotein, which ultimately will become an LDL, or low-density lipoprotein, which isn't shown in this, in this picture. Okay, now once the fatty acids are released into the adipose, okay, the adipose cell can rebuild the triglyceride, now store it for, um, for later during a fast. And you can see that the sugar backbone will be coming from GLUT4 transporters that were translocated to the surface in response to insulin. Remember that insulin translocates GLUT4 transporters not only in skeletal muscle, 
but also fat cells. And so in the presence of insulin, we'll have the LPL enzyme induced and the GLUT4 transporters on the surface to ensure that this glucose um, will be ultimately made into the sugar backbone. And now I have the triacylglycerol stores that I can use for later during a fast. Okay, so this is really important because if for some reason APOC2 is defective or LPL was defective, okay, you will end up with very high triglycerides in the blood, not just from VLDL. What's not shown here is another triglyceride-carrying molecule, chylomicrons, which you get during a meal, and those would be built up as well, and you end up with something called hypertriglyceridemia. Okay, if you have a problem with this, with this metabolism of these triglyceride-rich particles. Also, if you imagine, if you didn't have insulin around, like let's say you, had, you were a type 1 diabetic that wasn't being treated or you had problem with insulin action, LPL doesn't work very well and you end up getting very high triglycerides in the blood, which is not uncommon in patients with diabetes. Okay, so there's lots of applications to this diagram. So we finally go back to um, the beginning here. We talked about the liver and fat and um, the importance of um, the liver supplying the fat with the, um, the VLDL. Fat also can get triglycerides from chylomicrons as well. The structure, we have the glycerol backbone with the three um, fatty acyl groups. And now in terms of production for regulation, it's the fatty acids available that are going to really determine um, um, not only in liver but also fat um, the synthesis of triglycerides and the LPL enzyme is the major site of regulation for metabolism through mostly insulin induction. So during a fast, when we have low insulin levels, we don't have the lipoprotein lipase enzyme being induced. And during the well-fed state, when we have lots of sugar stimulating insulin release, we now have the lipoprotein lipase enzyme induced, which is going to help store um, triglyceride uh, fats in adipose cells. And that concludes this lecture on triglyceride biosynthesis and metabolism.